So Chris Martin is going to talk a little bit more about the uh, Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, in particular around COVID and mode effects. So Chris is Research Director at Ipsos in Scotland. Uh, he's been involved with large-scale surveys in Scotland, the Scottish Crime and Justice Survey, Scottish Household Survey, and the Scottish House Conditions Survey for over 20 years. Okay, so Chris, I um, welcome you to start your talk. Thank you very much. It's lovely to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about mode effects and how the changes pre and post pandemic uh, in the Scottish Crime Survey did, or spoiler alert, I think Stuart has given you the punchline, did not uh, change, the, change the result. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous after the uh, questions in the second session. Uh, uh, this might be a little bit whistle stop. Uh, I'll whiz through a bit of background to mode effects and touch on three previous studies that I think uh, are particularly relevant to it. Uh, I'll briefly summarise the, the change of approach pre and post pandemic, but I want to concentrate on our analysis of, of what the, those changes and, and how they impact the estimates and making a distinction between the, the mode of approach and the, and, and the mode of interview, and then try and uh, finish by drawing out some lessons for the, for the future. So please allow me one slide just to summarise from a theoretical perspective at the start. How does survey mode relate to survey accuracy? Well, surveys are susceptible to many types of error and the the main way of looking at this is through the total survey error framework. Uh, survey mode tends to influence two areas, and here it's uh, useful to, to draw the distinction between how people are interviewed, uh, whether that's by telephone or face-to-face -face or some form of self-completion, and how people are approached to take part, uh, whether an interview calls at their address or whether they're phoned up or whether they receive a survey invite by, by email uh, uh, or by post, or, or a combination of those. Uh, so research that relies on voluntary participation is always vulnerable to non-response. In other words, that those who take part in the uh, are different from those that don't. And how people are approached to take part, whether it's by face-to-face -face or telephone or, or postal, tends to impact on, 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 on non-response error and the patterns you get there. And over the years, the uh, uh, crime survey in Scotland has been pretty good. Uh, when you compare it to the other uh, big population surveys, uh, it has done very well. I know the importance of anchoring, so that's why it's against the big population surveys, not the crime survey of England, of England and Wales, but it has performed, has performed well. The other side uh, of the total survey error th way is, is the, way that mode the, the, the way that mode impacts quality is through how interviews, are, how interviews are conducted, the mode of the interview, and this tends to influence measurement error, the way that there are differences between the responses uh, answer and the, and the true value. So for example, if an interviewer is present or not, so respondents tend to be more engaged when there's an interviewer there, but they'd be more likely to give socially desirable answers. And there's also differences in whether information is transmitted visually, so whether show cards are, show cards are used or, or, or not. Before turning to the, the crime survey, I just want to mention three, uh, briefly, three studies that I think provide useful uh, context to it. The first is the, uh, the, the, the Scottish Crime and Victimisation Calibration uh, Study, and this in some ways reminds us that issues around about public value uh, and value for money are not new, uh, they've been around for a long time. So in 2003 there was moves to make the crime survey in Scotland uh, into a, a, a large chunk of that using a telephone approach. Uh, they ran uh, parallel field work, so a large face-to-face -face study, a large random digit dial uh, telephone study, and the calibration exercise said, well, what, how, do they, how do they look like? Uh, but at the end of it, the, the, the report that compared the two, uh, basically con concluded they couldn't devise a weighting strategy that satisfactorily corrected for all the many demographic biases that were observable in the data. So in the end, they went back to the face-to-face to -the -face approach. Uh, the second is a much smaller study, uh, and it looks at the impact not just of, not really of mode, but of response rate on survey estimates. So this analysis was similar to previous work done by 
Joe, Joe Williams and, and others on the Crime Survey of England and Wales, so it assessed uh, the impact of a lower response rate had on survey estimates by looking at what the survey estimates would look like if you hadn't done any reissues. So uh, for most surveys, uh, after the initial interview has gone out, you get a second interviewer to try and convert refusals or on, on non-contacts. In the Scottish Crime Survey, that, that would uh, increase the response rate by eight or nine percentage points. So what happens to the estimates before, uh, if, you, if you didn't you have that uh, reissue? So it's basically saying, what would happen if your response rate was eight or nine percent lower? And overall, the impact was, was pretty small. So I think this is the, the key uh, the, the findings. On the left, we did it over two waves. So the first was the 2012-2013 estimates of victimization, uh, and on the right is the 2016-2017. And you can see that on, on both waves, the difference is less than half of one percentage points. That relates to a difference of eight or nine percent in terms of the response rate. So a pretty small uh, difference when you for something which actually uh, reissues cost even more money uh, to do face to face than than your first issue, first issue ones. And the third one, I just wanted to finally touch on the Scottish Household Survey uh, mode report. Uh, so, like most major surveys, the, it hadn't changed its, its approach radically over 20 plus years. It used a standard face to face approach, and then the pandemic hit and things had to change. And it went out into the field pretty early. So instead of interviews visiting addresses, we relied on people opting in in response to uh, advanced mail outs. We tried to match telephone numbers to the sample addresses so we can make an approach by telephone. Uh, and we carried out uh, the interviews, interviews remotely, either by telephone or by video. Uh, so four takeaways from the analysis. Interviewers are really good at persuading people to take part in the survey. Uh, the revised approach resulted in much, much lower response rates because you're relying on that opt-in. Secondly, the difference between the pre-pandemic estimates and the revised approach was small for most e estimates, but, but there were some really notable exceptions, such as tenure. Those you tend to lose are the most deprived, the least educated, the most chaotic, the most vulnerable, uh, those of lower literacy skills. Uh, sometimes the people who you're most interested in, in developing policy uh, for interviewers are really good at getting these types of people to take part in, uh, in, in, in surveys. Thirdly, while the telephone matching increased the overall response rate, it didn't make the achieved sample more representative. It made it worse. Response rate doesn't equal whether it is, uh, doesn't equal re representative necessary. And finally, it's not just who takes part, but it's how you ask the questions that matter. So we found evidence of a difference between whether people took part by video or whether two people took part by, by, by telephone. Uh, so the report concluded that you couldn't look at the time series results because of the change in approach with the, with the household survey. <coughs> so how did the uh, crime survey uh, change uh, during COVID? Well, uh, I'm not going to go through the, the, the uh, methodology before COVID, standard face-to-face uh, -face approach. Uh, and we're quite lucky for the crime survey because when the pandemic closed everything down, we'd almost finished the 2019-2020 wave. This is, I think, how I felt when and pand the pandemic hit. I, I'm still not entirely sure what the, where we are now, what the fifth panel would be. I think it may have stopped raining, but I think I might still be, still be up the tree. Uh, uh, and so the, the, the telephone survey uh, happened in, in, in the autumn. Uh, with the, the, the post-survey wave starting in, in uh, November 2021. And it's the contrast between the pre-pandemic uh, wave and not the telephone one, but the, the post-pandemic wave that I want to uh, draw a distinction with. So how did the approach change? Well, the change wasn't that great in terms of the overall approach. There was a change to the response rate assumptions that were amended from, the, from being in the 60s to dropping to the 40s. The first half of it, the mode of approach, was a knock to nudge approach, where interviews would still go to people's homes. In, in, interview travel was a, 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 a allowed then, unlike the SHS that had started earlier, but the mode of approach was different. It wasn't face-to-face -face in home. It used either telephone or, 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 or video. So uh, it, was, it was mainly the mode of interview that changed. And the second half of the field work was very close to return to normal, bar the lower, uh, lower response rates. So, what was the impact uh, on the estimates? So, let's have a look at the impact on the 
the approach and first of all the impact on the response rate so pre-pandemic 63 percent post-pandemic it dropped to 47 percent so a drop of 16 percentage points similar to comparable surveys uh, although it's not straightforward to calculate we can broadly say that the knocks and nudge stage the earliest stage had a lower response rate of around about three or six percent but as was discussed in the in the earlier uh, session as well as the overall response rate the variation response rate is also important uh, greater variation between different types of area would suggest a greater potential for bias uh, response rates tend to be lowest in the most deprived areas and you want to minimize that but you want to minimize the variation uh, in the post-pandemic wave, although the response rate was lower, the variation was still very similar. And that's very much in marked contrast to things like the, uh, the telephone survey, uh, where there's a much wider variation between the, uh, by, by area deprivation. So moving on to the estimates, we looked at a number of different measures, uh, both weighted and unweighted, and a number of different ways. Uh, so overall, for most of these measures, there was very different. Uh, there was very little difference in the, the point estimates after the weighting. The largest differences were in tenure, uh, household income, and, and, and attainment. Let me just whiz you through a few of the results. So, first age, as you can see, there was really not much difference in the, in the weighted figures. Unsurprising, this is part of the, the weighting schema. But also, there wasn't really that much difference in the unweighted figures, either in terms of the profile of respondents, which. I found was quite surprising. In terms of tenure after the pandemic, uh, an increase in owner occupiers, a decrease in renters, but relatively modest, 2.4%. Uh, this sort of was reflective that the achieved sample was very slightly more affluent on a range of measures uh, post COVID than pre COVID. Uh, I think it reflects that when the response rate drops, the people who you lose tend to be. The more, the, the, the more deprived the, 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 those of, with uh, uh, lower uh, educational attainment. And this was the uh, finding where there's the biggest difference between the pre and the post uh, waves. Uh, so in the post COVID waves, the sample is more educated. So you can see a drop of five and a half percentage points in the proportion with no uh, qualifications between the two. Now, how do the two halves of the fieldwork differ? So if you then look again at attainment and split the figures between the two halves of the, of the, of the field work, this can't be a perfect anal analysis because they're not perfectly sort of random, uh, randomly selected samples, but they shouldn't be too far off. So as you can see from the return to in-home, the results, the dark blue bars, these were a bit closer to the 2019-2020 results than the initial knock to nudge stage, the, the light blue bars. So for example, closer on the estimate for people with a, with a degree. And I suppose that would be as you'd expect, because it sort of reflects the, 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 the return to in-home stage was much similar to the, uh, than the, the Knox and Ash stage to the, to the pre-COVID pre uh, approach. So just finally, I suppose, what one of the main uh, important areas of the, of the survey is, is, is victimization. So overall, the results suggested that there'd been a small but significant drop in victimization post COVID and in violent crimes. But how confident can we be that this reflects a real change and not just a change in the, in the, in, in the sample profile? Uh, so, I mean, I think that the, the key thing to do is look at victimization by the thing that most changed in terms of the sample profile, which is the educational qualifications. Uh, two things to note here. First, the likelihood of being a victim of crime is not that associated with educational attainment. It's relatively flat across the different ones. And secondly, across the different groupings, the overall pattern is, is similar. So a small drop in victimization across each of those groups between uh, the pre and the post pandemic waves. So we concluded that this means that the change to the profile sample was unlikely to have more than a marginal impact to the estimates of victimization. And I just want to briefly talk about the sort of second half of that, which is not so much the, the impact of the change of approach, how people are asked to take part, but also the, the, the impact of the, of the mode of in interview. 
So overall, 57% uh, of the interviews were carried out face-to-face, -face, majority face-to-face, -face, four in 10 by uh, telephone, and just a tiny proportion uh, by, by video, uh, less than 2%. Uh, looking at the impact of the mode of interview is much more complicated and much harder to estimate than the mode of appro approach for the, for the response rates because this can happen in a, the effects can happen in a variety of different ways. It's not a binary, did they take part, did they not take part uh, type thing. So the fact is that drive people uh, to, the, the factors that drive how people respond to questions is, 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 is pretty com complex. We looked for two potential effects. Firstly, we looked to see if people gave fewer answers to multi-code questions where the survey is completed uh, by telephone without show cards. So for example, looking at educational uh, qualifications and the number of qualifications they said they had if they said they had a degree. Uh, and secondly, we looked uh, at uh, how they used five-point scales uh, from strongly agree to strongly disagree. This is relatively standard formation uh, for a questionnaire design, but previous research suggested that when you're using that five-point scale, face-to-face -face approaches that use show cards uh, can build uh, more respondent engagement, so you get less don't knows and refusals, but also that uh, show cards tend to capture neutral responses, so in the middle, uh, the response in the, in the five-point in the, in the five scale. Uh, we found very little evidence of impact uh, uh, of, of, of this in, uh, in, in, the, in the crime survey, much less compared to the, the earlier SH, uh, the household survey work. I think there was two major mitigating factors that uh, compared to the, to the household survey. I mean, it's, it's partly that the crime survey is comparatively less reliant on long, on long show cards to give those visual cues to respondents in terms of how they should, should answer uh, on, on multi-code questions. Uh, but it was also because the crime survey, unlike the SHS, were able to visit each home and could give paper copies of the show cards on the doorstep to people, so they could almost always use show cards. So that overall, uh, that for the vast majority of interviews uh, that we used had some form of show card. Uh, and I think that was the sort of key thing in terms of minimizing the impact of the mode of interview, which is the big change between the pre and the post, uh, uh, post waves. So just a couple of final reflections that, again, echo some of the things that have been, been said uh, earlier on, 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 on today. In terms of the, the, the crime, specifically on the crime survey, uh, uh, Scottish crime survey and the, the post, uh, whether, you could make, uh, whether you could make comparisons, the difference between the, the approaches was relatively small, so the impact of these changes on the estimates was small and unlikely to have a big impact on on, on, on key, key measures, so that meant that we concluded that we were confident that trends over time in substantive findings represented genuine, genuine changes. Uh, but I think the sort of wider lessons for the future uh, in terms of mode effects, I mean, one thing I think that we should say is that mode effects depend on what you're measuring. Uh, so a difference in approach may have no effect on one variable, but might have a really sizable effect on, on, on another variable. So it works at the question level not at the survey level. The second thing is that response rates aren't everything. When you look at representativeness, you want to look at how response rates differ between different types of areas and the characteristics of the sample profile variables that are most likely to be impacted. It's not just the uh, overall response rate that's, that, that's important. And then also just in terms of inclusivity, I don't think that offering a mode of choice necessarily improves inclusivity. And I think that face-to-face -face is still the best way of reaching hard-to-reach groups, the less affluent, those of lower literacy, the less civically engaged, the less research uh, literate. But these debates around about public value, quality and cost are gonna, 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 gonna be there. Uh, uh, and trying to unpack the quality side of the equation of the, of the cost versus quality is much harder to do because, because these, these effects work in, 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 in many different ways. Uh, so that's pretty much, we, this is obviously an area where there's lots of work going on at the moment uh, in a number of different studies, the Labour Force survey, uh, but just to highlight that there's also work going on by the ESRC survey futures work, uh, 
uh, and the Scottish Government is currently undertaking its review of the long-term survey strategy looking at issues around uh, uh, mixed mode and the, and the future of, of, of survey research. Uh, if anyone wants the full details, uh, the paper's online in the Scottish Government website. Thank you very much.